How many of you want to thrive? Okay, we're going to have to do better because if you're going to thrive, you have to want it. We're going to start a series today called Thrive, and I'm, I'm actually more excited about this series than I have been about a lot of things in a long time, except perhaps my daughter, Olive. Um, this series is, uh, it, it has the potential, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, over speaking here. I really believe this. This has the potential to be life changing, not only for you, but for those uh, of uh, your friends and people in your life. This is a series that I think will take us to the next level as a community and as individuals. And there's four parts to it. There's four weeks. And what I would just stress is don't miss a week because each week of this series builds on the previous week. It's going to be in John 15. So by the, by the end of this series, we're going to know John 15 really well. It's four parts right there in John 15. So if you want to read ahead, uh, you can do that. That would be awesome. But today we'll be in John 15, one through three. And I want to begin with this idea is that Jesus actually wants us to thrive. Okay. I want, I want this to kind of be the, the foundation of this series is that Jesus is actually for us thriving. He actually wants us to have lives that thrive. He says this in John 10, 10, he says, I have come that they may have life and have life more abundantly. This is right after he's talked about what the enemy wants to do, which is to steal, kill, and destroy. And he says, not only do I not want to do that, but I want to give life and I want to give abundant life. I want to have, I want to have my followers experience the kind of life that everyone's always dreamed of. And so to get there, I think what we need to look at is before we can look at what it looks like to thrive, we need to look at what it actually looks like just to survive. Because one of the things that I'm convinced of is that most of us live in this kind of survival mentality. Like we just survive. So when someone comes along and says, hey, you can actually thrive in life, the answer to that is, ah, I'm too busy. I'm too busy to thrive. I'm, I'm too tired. I'm too this. I'm too that. So if we're going to thrive, we have to know what it looks like to survive. So to survive, let's just look at what it looks like to survive physically. Someone who's just surviving physically. A person who's just surviving physically may walk up a flight of stairs and, and be out of breath. How many of you have been there? You know what I'm talking about. My daughter, Olive, she lives on the second floor. That's where we put her when she goes to sleep. And so um, and if, if I take her, if we, we do everything downstairs, you know, it's one of those nights where we, we change her, we've got her pajamas on, all that, so we feed her, and it's time to take her to bed. If I walk up the stairs, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this, she weighs 15 pounds. It's not like I'm carrying a lot of weight. But if I walk her up the stairs and into to the nursery, there's a song that we sing her. And most of the time, if I do all that at once, I can't get through the song. Like I'm out of breath. And it's like, good night, sweet Miss Olive. It's time for your be <sighs> bed. We'll put on your PJs real fast. Sleepy head. <sighs> Oh, sorry. And she's always like, Daddy, why are you like out of breath? And, and she doesn't say that. She's only 10 months old. But if she could talk, she would say, Daddy, like, why are you dying? And it's because I'm just surviving physically. You guys have been there. The person who survives physically is the person who they don't have a lot of energy to make it through the day, right? It's 10 a.m. What do they need? Coffee. It's 2 p.m. What do they need? Yes, absolutely. So, and that, and that is actually not a good thing. It's so normal that we think that's the way we're supposed to operate. But if it's 10 and you can't get to 11 without coffee, then there's something wrong. You're just surviving physically. The person who's surviving physically can make it through today and make it through tomorrow, but they don't know about the next year or the next decade to come because they're just barely getting by. That person is, is a person who gets by day to day. The person who's surviving spiritually is not much different than the person who's surviving physically. The person who's just surviving in their spiritual life is the person who, when they open the Bible, they feel like it's written by someone they don't really know very well to people other than them. They don't feel this close connection with the author of Scripture, which we believe to be divinely inspired. And so if you're a follower of Christ and you believe the Bible is God's word, if you're just surviving spiritually, you may read those words and go, this seems like it's written for someone or to someone besides me. The person who survives phys uh, spiritually is the person who, when they pray, they feel like they're talking to someone that they don't really know. And when they pray, if you've ever been there, when you're just kind of surviving spiritually, you pray and it's almost like, hey God, if, I know you're mad probably because it's been a long time, but you know, I'm back. And so anyway, forgive me for all these, you know, I'm gonna list out all the sins I've committed because then I can actually approach you. And you know, so, okay, it, we got that over the, out of the way. So please, you know, help me in this area. And you just really, you feel like you're going back to your parents and like asking for money again. You know, that's not thriving. 
that's surviving. And yet so many of us, that really is our Christian experience where when it comes to generosity, if we're just surviving spiritually, we're not generous. How, how would we be? We're thinking about ourselves and if we're barely getting by, if we're barely getting from day to day to day, then it's really difficult for us to look at the needs of someone else and go, ah, I should meet that need. Or, or love, I know for me, if I'm just surviving spiritually, it's very difficult for me to love other people in the way that I believe God has commanded me to love. And even though I know I'm supposed to, it's often difficult because I'm focused on self. That's what it looks like to survive spiritually. And I just wonder if any of this resonates with your experience right now. And it's funny that we, we categorize physical and spiritual, and we could get into all the relational, how it looks like to survive relational, how it looks like to, to survive emotionally, how it, looks like, how it looks like to survive at work. Some of you are like, I'm there, you know, I barely make it in, you know, I show up late, leave early, you know, don't do anything while I'm there, and you're not going to last long, right? But that's, that's what it looks like to, no pointing, you, you're not supposed to point at people um, or look at them glaringly. Um, and so some of you, in every area of your life, you would say, Dad, there are some places where I feel like I'm just surviving. I, I'm walking up the stairs and I'm out of breath. And I wonder, I wonder what it would look like if we began to actually thrive. So think about this. If we began to thrive spiritually, it actually permeates every area of our life. Because we don't, we categorize things, but all of life is connected. So if you begin to actually thrive in your spiritual walk, which is what we're going to focus on for the next four weeks, that is a holistic thriving. To thrive spiritually really is to thrive emotionally because your heart is connected to the, the very source of life. To thrive spiritually is, is to thrive relationally because when, you, when you're thriving spiritually, that means that you, you have this love that overflows from you that God gives you and you're connected to others in community, which is why we, why we do these gatherings is so that we can be connected and why after this we're actually gonna be in connections. We have pizza today and we're, just to foster some connection because we believe that when you thrive spiritually, you thrive in every area of your life. And so for the next four weeks, if we just pause and really think about what does it look like for us as followers of Christ to be people who thrive in our relationship with God and then let that permeate into every other area of our life. Are you, are you down with that? Is that still something people say? Okay, I'm good. I just want to make sure. All right, so if you're down with that, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to learn a little phrase. This is, I'm just going to, it's cheesy, all right? But you probably will remember it. You're going to say it with me. I'm going to say it the first time, then you're going to say it the second time. To not just survive, but thrive, you got to be connected to the vine. Okay, you guys ready for this? To not just survive, but thrive, be connected to the vine. All right, one more time. To not just survive, but thrive, you got to be connected to the vine. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Well, maybe next time we'll, you can say it seven times in your head. But here's the thing. To not just survive. So we don't, we don't want to survive. We want to thrive. And what we're going to focus on today is going to be very simple. We've got to be connected to the vine. And that's going to take us to our passage today, John 15, 1 through 3. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, you can download it on your smartphone, the YouVersion Bible app. If you just look up Bible, the icon looks just like that. And you'll be on You'll be, you'll be in the word in a matter of seconds for free. So John 15, this is starting a new chapter. So we ended our series last week, The Comfort Zone, with this idea that we find our peace in any circumstance because of our faith in a perfect Savior. So right after that, Jesus begins this kind of discourse that's going to take us through the next several chapters of John, where he's just going to be teaching his disciples. He's kind of giving them just, hey, here's what I think about a lot of different things. Some, some final words. We're going to see that he's going to pray in John 17. He's going to do some amazing things. And in John 15, he's really preparing them for here is what it looks like as a Christian to live a life where you are thriving. So here's what he says. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. So Jesus begins with this kind of metaphor of vines and vineyards and branches. And he says, I am the vine. In other words, I'm the, the source of life. I'm the true vine, which means that when you're connected to me, you are connected 
to the absolute source of truth. So there is no other true vine besides Jesus. And he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser or the gardener. Okay? In first century Palestine, the most common agriculture was vineyards. It was wine. And so these people would have known this metaphor, would have spoken volumes to them, that you have vineyards and they have to be pruned and they bear fruit. And if the branch isn't connected to the vine, it doesn't bear fruit. And so he's going to carry this metaphor through the whole chapter. But just know for now that Jesus refers to himself as the vine, as the source of of life. And so the very first thing that we have to do to move past surviving to thriving is we got to be connected to the vine. We have to be connected to the vine because as followers of Christ, as the branches in this example, we can't bear fruit, we can't thrive, we can't live, we can't do any more than exist without being connected to the vine. But there's one thing that happens uh, in us as, as we're connected to the vine, and that is we bear fruit. Every branch in me, he says, that does not bear fruit, he takes away, verse two. So the question is, how do you know if you're not bearing fruit? And how do you know if the fruit that you are bearing is kind of like not the right fruit? I think this is an important question for us to ask. So in Galatians five, the apostle Paul does kind of a discussion of this, the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you have, may have heard this, this it's kind of a list, but it's actually one thing. It's if you have the Spirit, this is the fruit it produces. And he juxtaposes that to the kind of works of the flesh, and we're gonna look at this list together. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. When the Bible talks about the flesh, this is a way of saying you apart from God, okay? Mortal man apart from the intervention of God in them. That's what flesh is. So the Bible often talks about the flesh being this effort to do something without God. It says the works of the flesh are evident, meaning that in, in these people, this is what you see. This is the fruit that they have. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, which is where you make something a God that's not a God. Sorcery, enmity, strive, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So Paul throws in this, and things like these, just in case, like, if this wasn't a long enough list, if I didn't cover everything, just know what I'm saying is, is that the works of the flesh are all of the different things, all of the different evil things that mankind can come up with. That's what he's saying. The works of the flesh are evident. So in the people who aren't connected to the vine, this is what happens. And then the next thing he says is very important. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me, let me stop right there. So what Paul is not saying is he's not saying that by doing these things, you have disearned your way to heaven because you don't earn your way to heaven anyway. The way you have inheritance of the kingdom of God, the way you are with God is through Jesus and your faith in him. So what he's saying is, is that these things are evident in people who don't know God. This is what it looks like when we're not connected to the vine, he says. This is what it looks like when people don't know Christ. And he's not trying to be mean. He's just saying, like, this is what people do. And if you think about it, it just kind of makes sense. If you're not a follower of Christ, why, like, why, why would you try to like, live up to a different standard when the entire thrust of the world is like, hey, do what you want, do what feels good. Most of that list is just, hey, if it feels good, do it. If, if you feel anger, go for it. If you feel some kind of sexual urge, go for it. You wanna have a drunken party, go for it. That's what he's saying. He's saying these things are what people who do not know Christ do. But he draws a sharp contrast between what those, those things and what people who follow Christ do. And so here's where it gets really, really interesting. If you claim to follow Christ, and you look at these two different lists, and we're going to read the fruit of the Spirit here in a second, you can see it on the screen. But if you look at those two lists and you go, yeah, my, when I really think about it, my life looks a lot more like the previous list, the, the drunken orgy part. That's really where, that's where my life kind of lands. Then you might want to think about if you truly know Christ, that's not to be mean. I'm just saying that's why he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do these things, those who these things are evident in their life probably don't know God. But then he says this, and this is, I love this. He says, but the fruit, everybody say fruit. The fruit, the branch, we're gonna see this next week, the branch doesn't make its own fruit, 
The branch produces fruit because of the vine. So when you are connected to Jesus, this is the fruit you produce. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that's in you when, you're, when you know Christ as your Savior is love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, it's kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, he says, there is no law. There is no requirement. There is no penalty against these things. These things are what happens when we're connected to Christ. So the question that I have for you today is, are you connected to the vine? And I'm not asking you to think about merely your behavior. Again, you have to get this. Your behavior is just a result. It is not the cause. You can't good behavior your way into favor with God. And you can't bad behavior your way out of favor with God. What he is saying is that when you truly know Christ, this is what happens. You begin to produce spiritual fruit. Does it happen overnight? No. Are you going to be perfect? No. Are you still going to make mistakes? Absolutely. But the overall preponderance of your life, when you look back on it in 10, 20, 30 years, what are you going to see? Are you going to see a life where you're continually looking more like Jesus and producing spiritual fruit, or it's being produced within you, and you're more loving and more joyous and more peaceful and less of what we see all around us, or is it the other way around? And I think what Paul is saying is you just got to look at that. Jesus says the same thing in, in verse 2. He says, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So Jesus takes away non-fruit-bearing branches. Does this mean that if we cease to bear spiritual fruit, that we'll lose our standing with God? Does it mean that we'll lose our salvation, that we were once in Christ and forgiven and clean, and we could somehow lose that by too much bad behavior or turning our back on God? I don't think that's what he's saying. I think, it's what, I think what he's saying is that those who don't know Christ are going to not produce spiritual fruit. And when they don't produce spiritual fruit, they're going to be taken away. Uh, consider these two verses. This is in John as well. John 6, 37. He says, all that the Father, Jesus is speaking, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. He's saying, those who truly know me, those who truly follow me are with me, and I'm never going to reject them. John 8, 31 says, if you abide in my word, you are my true disciples. To abide, we're going to talk about this a lot next week, but to abide just means to remain, to stay. So he says, if you stay, you are. Think about this. It's that by abiding, you actually prove that you're Jesus' disciples. You don't earn it, but you actually show who you really are. So he says, those of you who really know me, those of you who actually are in me, you will produce fruit. So what about the person who claims to be a Christian and maybe they were a follower of Christ for a period of time and they, and they fall away or they just, you talk, to them and you talk to them now and you say, they're not, a, they're not even a claiming to be a Christian anymore. Well, it's very likely that that person never truly knew Jesus. If you think about Judas a few weeks back, we looked at how Judas, Jesus looked at him and said, you were never clean. One of you is not clean, Peter, you can go back, but Peter wanted Jesus, if he's going to wash his feet, he says, hey, wash, wash all of me. And Jesus looks at him and says, if you already know me, you're clean, I don't have to wash all of you, but one of you isn't. And the entire time Judas was with him, he was following him, and then at the very end, we saw who Judas really was. Judas was someone who was faking it. He was close to Jesus, but not following Jesus, not in Christ, not his faith wasn't in him. So my question for you today to consider is, is your faith in Jesus real? Are you connected to the vine? Because not only will you not thrive if you're not connected to the vine, but you won't survive. Jesus is saying, if you're not connected to me, it's not going to go well for you. So the question is, do you truly know Jesus? The second thing that we want to do, if we're going to be, if we're going to be thriving, if we're going to kick this off, is we got to be ready for pruning the very next thing that Jesus says in this passage, he says already, uh, uh, verse, the second part of verse two, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus is saying that some of you are gonna bear fruit and because you're bearing fruit, I'm gonna actually prune you so that you can bear more fruit. What does that mean? Well, let's look a little bit at some, what, what the actual process of pruning. So this is a vine that is actually healthy. 
okay? And this is a normal practice where you have a healthy vine that's producing, you know, fruit and good leaves, and the gardener, the vine dresser, whatever you call him, will actually go and clip branches short, clip them off. And this is a painful process, but what this actually does is it makes the vine grow stronger because it's just the way the natural process works. D.A. Carson comments on this. He says, no fruit-bearing branch is exempt. Doubtless, the, father, the Father's purpose is loving. It is so that each branch will, bear even more, will be even more fruitful, but the procedure may be painful. So the question you may be asking is, what does it look like when you go through pruning? And the answer is, I don't really know. You could look at maybe Hebrews 12, which talks about how God will discipline those he loves, and maybe it's that. Or you could just look at the kind of general principle of life that when you go through difficult things, you grow stronger. Last week, one of our staff members talked about how he had a, a, a stent put in his heart, and he had kind of like uh, chest pains for several months, and then he finally got to the bottom of what it was, and they were able to put some stents in there, and he went through this procedure. And he was giving us a kind of devotion last Tuesday morning as a staff about his experience. And one of the things he said is he's like, you know, it was really painful, it was really hard, but God seems to teach me more in those really tough times than in any other time. And he went through all the different things that God taught him, one of which was that the, the doctor, the cardiologist, had to run a, a line through his arm, like through inside a vein, up his arm and into his heart to look around and see what was going on. Isn't that amazing? And he was just saying, like, this guy had to do that with such care and such precision. And we, as followers of Christ, we as people who point people to Jesus, and especially those of us who have the, the burden of leadership, we do heart work as well. Like we, we're working on people's spiritual hearts and we need to have the same kind of precision that those doctors have. And that was just one of many things that he learned through a very difficult situation. And I think it's a great example of what Jesus is talking about, that here you got someone who's bearing fruit and they need to be bearing even more fruit. So they're gonna go through something. Does God cause it? Does he allow it? Okay, yeah, maybe, maybe both, maybe neither. I, I don't exactly know, but here's what I do know. We live in a fallen world and we go through stuff. And when we go through stuff that's painful and hurts, God uses it. And God uses it to prune us and to get us ready to bear more and more and more fruit. It's kind of like muscles. If you never work a muscle, um, it will eventually atrophy. How many of you have like gone a few years without going to the gym and then you finally go back to the gym? Nobody? Okay, a few months. Okay, we got a bunch of meatheads in here. You guys are in the gym every day. I get it. But there's times where I will like not be at the gym for a while and I go to the gym and I work out and I work out really hard and I work out harder than I should. And when it's all said and done, my, my whole body is just mush, right? Because my muscles have weakened. But that, that process of like breaking down your muscle actually makes it stronger. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to teach us that when we go through things, it could just be that he's pruning us, that he's getting ready, getting us ready for ministry, getting us ready to bear fruit, getting us ready to love other people well, getting us ready to thrive. The very last thing he says, and we'll end with this. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Jesus speaks of the word. He says, when you know the word, it's, it has a cleansing effect. So if you're connected to me and you're in me and you're bearing fruit and I'm pruning you and we're going through this process, the way that you're able to endure that is to know the word. That's what cleanses your mind. That's what cleanses your soul. That's why in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this. This is kind of an interesting statement. It says, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? This is an Old Testament quote. He says, but we have the mind of Christ. Jesus in John 1 was referred to as the Word. So the Word was God, the Word was with God, the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. And so when we know Jesus, the living Word, and we know the Word of God, the written Word, he's saying, then you can get through this. So where we're going to end today is this. I just have two questions, and this is, this is it, and we'll be done. The first thing is, are you connected to the vine? Only you can answer that question. Do you know Jesus? And the second thing is, are you ready to be pruned? Are you ready for God to work in your life? One of the, one of the, best, one of the best ways that you can prepare for that is to know God's Word, to be in God's Word so that 
that cleansing effect can happen so that your mind can be ready, so that you can have the mind of Christ just ready to go. So are you connected to the vine? And are, are, you, are you in God's word? Let's pray.